And in that chapter, Revelation chapter 1, we will read verses 10 through 20 responsively tonight. Verses 10 through 20. Let's all read together on verse 10 and then every other verse through verse 20 tonight here in Revelation chapter 1. I was in the Spirit on the Lord's day and heard behind me a great voice as of a trumpet saying, I am Alpha and Omega, the first and the last, and what thou seest, write in a book, and send it unto the seven churches which are in Asia, unto Ephesus, and unto Smyrna, and unto Pergamos, and unto Thyatira, and unto Sardis, and unto Philadelphia, and unto Laodicea. And I turned to see the voice that spake with me, and being turned, I saw seven golden candlesticks. And in the midst of the seven candlesticks, one like unto the Son of Man, clothed with a garment down to the foot, and girt about the paps with a golden girdle. His head and his hairs were white like wool, as white as snow, and his eyes were as a flame of fire, and his feet like unto fine brass, as if they burned in a furnace, and his voice as the sound of many waters. And he had in his right hand seven stars, and out of his mouth went a sharp two-edged sword, and his countenance was as the sun shineth in his strength. And when I saw him, I fell at his feet as dead. And he laid his right hand upon me, saying unto me, Fear not, I am the first and the last. I am he that liveth and was dead. And behold, I am alive forevermore. Amen. And have the keys of hell and of death. Write the things which thou hast seen, and the things which are, and the things which shall be hereafter. The mystery of the seven stars, which thou sawest in my right hand, and the seven golden candlesticks. The seven stars are the angels of the seven churches, and the seven candlesticks, which thou sawest, are the seven churches. And Lord, thank you for this special section of your word, Lord, and the blessing that's given to those that read and obey these words. And I thank you, Lord, that we can uh, study this area tonight in your word. Meet with us, bless and fill our preacher with your spirit. And teach us, Lord, and help us to grow and be challenged. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you. You may be seated. Here we find the Lord Jesus reminding a persecuted people that he is living and that he is alive forevermore. I want you to take your eyes right now and look down at verse 18, please. For that is our text verse tonight. The Lord Jesus said, I am he that liveth. There's that I am in this series. In this series. I am he that liveth and was dead, and behold, I am alive forevermore. Amen. And have the keys of hell and death. Tonight we're looking at I am he that liveth. What does that mean? That was an encouraging statement, as I said a moment ago, to a persecuted people. And you know, are, are you like me? I think we're like each other all the way around. Just more often than not, we need encouragement, don't we? It's kind of a discouraging thing to listen to the news, though we do. It's kind of a discouraging thing to read the news, though we do. It's kind of an a discouraging thing, I should say, not encouraging a discouraging thing when we look at what's going on in the world around us, when we realize the political sicknesses that are in our country right now and around the world, and we need encouragement when we see that. It's like saying, Lord, is this all there is? Like in the book of Revelation where they ask and said, Lord, how long? And we need the encouragement that God can give. That's what he was doing here. And he said to these persecuted people, he said, I am he that liveth. I was dead, but I'll live forevermore. He let them know that he was alive. And this message tonight is going to remind us of what the Lord Jesus does in heaven. When he said, I am he that liveth, what did he mean by that? What are its implications to us tonight? We'll be looking at a number of other passages in the Bible. So don't put your Bible away or don't put your pen away and your note page away. You're going to want to write down the references. What does it mean to us to know that we serve a risen Savior? He's in the world today and we know that he is living whatever men may say. Men may doubt. It doesn't matter. He's alive and he's alive tonight. 
First of all, I want you to see this. Number one, if you're taking notes, but look, put it down on paper. You can count on it because it's in the Bible. And it's like Paul said this morning in our message, what saith the scriptures? Number one, we are saved by his life. When he said, I am he that liveth, he meant we are saved by his life. Pastor, what does that mean? Romans chapter 5 and verse 10. For if when we were enemies, we were reconciled to God by the death of his son and much more being reconciled, we shall be saved by his life. Getting saved is a one-time event. You put your faith and trust in Jesus, that's it. You're not working your way to heaven. You're not working your way to get to the pearly gate. You're not working your way to the golden street. You're not working your way to the many mansions that he's been building. No, salvation is a one-time deal. And the modernists today would like to say that this teaches us that we are saved by copying the life of Christ, uh, by using his life as an example. Now, we are to use his life as an example, but that's not going to save us. Nothing could be farther from the truth. Nobody is saved by living like Jesus or living for Jesus. Understand that. Remember, even in the Gospels, Jesus said, many will come to me in that day saying, Lord, Lord, and I will say, I never knew you. Religion doesn't save anybody. We are saved initially by trusting in the finished work of Christ on Calvary. And then we are saved by his life in the fact that he ever liveth. He's still alive today. Danny Parton got saved 60 years ago. That doesn't mean anything to the young people today, but it sure means the world to me. And what does the song say? Jesus is all the world to me. Well, it means a great deal to me. He's being saved 60 years ago. But you know what? I've been kept saved for all those years. And that is what brought has brought me to the place that I am even tonight. He rose from the dead. He is in heaven and he keeps me saved. In other words, the fact that he lives in heaven means that we are kept saved. I'm saved by his life. You see, I trusted Jesus as my savior. I'm so glad that I did. I thank God for that night on February the 16th, 1964, when uh, Bill Kellogg preached that sermon, whatever it was, that convicted this eight-year-old boy's heart. And he walked the aisle and told his pastor he wanted to be saved. And he put me with Ben Conrad, who took his Bible and showed me as an eight-year-old lad how to trust Jesus as my Savior. And on that night, I did. But I've been saved ever since. I uh, have not been the Christian I ought to be ever since, but I've been saved ever since. And I thank the Lord for that. And if you got saved at an early age, you ought to thank God you got saved at an early age. And I am glad that I did. In other words, the fact that he lives in heaven means that we are kept saved. And the word, look at the word saved, if you would please. What there in that verse, it says, and shall be saved by his life. That little word saved there. And this doesn't mean anything to anybody necessarily in this room. But that little word saved is in the Greek linear, the Greek language of the New Testament. And that means that we are saved and saved and saved and kept saved by his life. It's an ongoing thing. It just continues. We're not just saved and then lost. We're saved and saved and saved. It continues on, you see. And that's a wonderful promise that God has given. The eternal security of the believer is a real doctrine. And this morning, if you missed the message today, those of you that are online and you missed this morning's message, you ought to tune into it. I'm here to tell you, eternal security of the believer, eternal life is a real life doctrine in the Bible, once saved, always saved. It's not like the Nazarene lady who visited our church one time many, many years ago. It was right after we had gotten our tape duplicator. Remember tapes? <laughs> Those little square things that are about like that. They're called cassettes. And uh, we had been given a beautiful tape duplicator, which we still have in the office back there. You take one master and four slaves, and in lickety split, it would copy every one of them so fast. And I had taken it into a place, because it was given to us, it needed a little bit of work. And I took it into this place, and the lady that worked there visited our church. And uh, when I went back, I saw her there, and I said, thank you so much for coming to Timberline. It was a blessing having you there. Do you think you'll come back? And she said, no. I said, why not? She said, because you preach that old Baptist doctrine of once saved, always saved. And I thought, that's not a Baptist doctrine. That ought to be. That's a Bible doctrine. 
when you get born again, you can't get unborn again. Any more than those of you in this room that have been born, and everybody here has been born at one time or another, you cannot become unborn. And once you get born again, you cannot become unborn again. We are saved by his life. We are kept saved by his life. The fact that our Savior lives today and sits at the right hand of the Father, we are saved by his life. Secondly, if you're taking notes, we are we, he is our advocate. An advocate, what is that? First John chapter two and verse one. The Bible says, my little children, these things write I unto you that you sin not. Now, that's a good admonition, isn't it? Isn't that what every parent wants for their children? They don't want them to go out and mess around their life, mess their lives up in sin. Isn't that what every parent wants? God's the same way. And he inspired it in here. He said, my little children, these things write unto you that you sin not. And then, but look at the next line. And uh, if any man sin, it means it's going to happen. It says, if any man sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ, the righteous. He is our advocate. And the word advocate here, this is one of the neatest things. You may want to circle that word. You may want to underline it. You may want to write some things into it because I can just about guarantee you, double dog dare you, know that you never have heard that before. But that is the same word here that is used for helper in other places in the Bible. And it is the same word that is used for the word comforter in the word of God, one who's called alongside to help. I believe, uh, Brother Penn, in this particular place, it is the word parakletos. That is what is used here. And it means he's called alongside to, ha to be with us. He runs by our side. He is, the run he, uh, he is the runner to our side, and he is in heaven. And when we need him, he runs to our side. He is our advocate. He is our comforter. He is our helper. He is the one who runs alongside us to help us. Oh, the, the Christian life, Pastor, is so hard, and it's so lonely. Wait a minute. You have him as your advocate. You have the Lord Jesus as the one who runs alongside you. You have the one who is your comforter. You have the one who is your helper. What a joy that is. The fact that he is the one that ever liveth. He is our life and he is our advocate. He is in heaven and every time you need him, he runs to your side. What a great blessing. Number three, he is our intercessor. What does that mean? Hebrews chapter 7 and verse 25. Wherefore, and I like this verse, even though it's preached, I think, incorrectly and cutely, if I might say, it says, wherefore, he is able to save them to the uttermost. One preacher said he saves from the guttermost to the uttermost. And his context was he'll save the, the street urchin as well as he'll save the person who is most successful in life. That's not the right application. It makes good preaching, but it's not real good doctrine. When it says here that he saves them to the uttermost, that means he takes us to the nth degree of where we can grow. He never gives up on us. Being confident of this very thing that he which hath begun a good work in you will perform it until the day of Jesus Christ. Philippians chapter 1 and verse 6. And the word intercession here is interesting. You might want to remember this because you might only give it one meaning. But the word that is used here means he's our access to God. We can get to God through him. We come to God through him. We come to God by him. And he gives us access to the Father. He is between us and God. He is the one who runs in between. And no man can come to God, either for salvation or for prayer, except through Jesus Christ. Do you remember the verse, John fourteen six? I think sometimes we don't apply that in every case that it should be applied. But it says in John fourteen six, he said, I am the way the truth, and the life. But notice the next line. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. So he's the one that gives us access, you see. And in one mediator between God and man, which is the next point, number four, he is our mediator. First Timothy chapter two and verse five, it says, for there is one God and one mediator between God and men, the man Christ Jesus. Now, Again, I want to give you a word meaning. May I do that? Because I think sometimes we overlook the obvious, and I know I do. But please look at the word, uh, if you would please, there, uh, <clears throat> where it says he is our mediator. In this place, right here in Scripture, 
It literally means he's the one that makes peace for us and between us and God. He is our peacemaker. See, the Bible says the wrath of God abideth upon men. The Bible says that the unsaved, that when they die, they go to hell, not because God hates them, but because they rejected the plan of salvation that God has given them. But you know, the truth of the matter is, when you get saved, peace is made between you and God. As a sinner by nature, Jesus makes peace, and he is the peacemaker. And so how does that happen? Well, he went to Calvary, and he made peace with the Father by satisfying his righteous demands. You see, no man will see God without holiness, and that's the only way you're going to have it. Now, he comes to us and asks us to make peace with God by faith in Jesus Christ, and he is like a lawyer or an attorney in, in a court of law. He ple- We've studied that in Sunday school this morning. Zechariah chapter 3, verses 1 through 5. And Satan stood before the Lord and stood before Joshua, the high priest, and he accused him. And God said, no, 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 no. This is a brand I plucked out of the fire. He said, I've already saved him. Now it's time to clean his life up. And he did, but he kept him saved. He is our mediator. He's the one that made peace with God. And we can't break that. Number five, if you're writing things down, he is our life. Colossians chapter three and verse four. It says, when Christ, who is our life. Did you see that? When Christ, who is our life, shall appear. Then shall ye also appear with him in glory. Now, you have your Bible there at Colossians 3. If you would, just whip back, if you would, to Colossians chapter 1 and verse 27. Because it's explained even further. And it says in verse 27 of chapter 1, To whom God would make known what is the riches of the glory of this mystery among the Gentiles, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. Christ in you, the hope of glory. When I got saved, you know, we tell children to ask Jesus into your heart. Oh, so many men preach against that. Oh, don't ever ask Jesus into your heart. Oh, those silly men. God pity them. Nothing wrong with that because here the Bible says it's Christ in you. It's a hope of glory. A little boy went into the hospital to have his heart operated on. And the doctor was talking to him and he said, you're going to see Jesus in there. The doctor didn't quite understand, but the little boy understood because he had asked Jesus into his heart. And he wanted the doctor to know that if he cut his heart open, he was going to see Jesus in there. Now, when I was eight, I don't know the prayer that I prayed. I think I asked Jesus into my heart. Uh, All I know is I trusted Christ that night, February 16th, 1964, 60 years ago. But did I ask Jesus into my heart? More than likely I did. And God pity those men who ruin it for children. And they say that it's wrong. No, it's right here. Christ in you, the hope of glory. Uh, these two verses that I gave you, Colossians 1.27 and Colossians 3.4, they teach us a wonderful truth that when a person is saved, Christ comes into him to live. Jesus is in there. It's better than prego. They say, well, it's in there. Jesus is in there you see. And that is what the new life really is. That is what the new birth really is all about. When Jesus said to Nicodemus, "Ye must be born again. He's talking about getting that new birth, Jesus in you, Christ in you, the hope of glory. In other words, the very little, the very life that we live is Christ living in us. And the new life is Jesus, you see. Consequently, the battle between right and wrong in our lives is literally a battle between us and Christ, our old nature against him. Say, how do you know that? I've referred to this many times in the last number of weeks, but I've not read it to you. But I want to go to the book of Romans chapter 7, and I want to start reading in verse 14. One of the greatest Christians who ever walked the earth, and some say the best Christian who ever walked the earth, though I don't know that that's accurately true, is the Apostle Paul. He battled with the same things that you and I battle with. That's comforting to know that I'm not the only one that has those battles. It ought to be a comfort to you as well. In Romans chapter 7, beginning in verse 14, says, We know that the law is spiritual, but I am carnal, sold under sin. For that which I do, I allow not. For what I would, that do I not. But what I hate, that I do. Boy, does that sound like our testimony or what? I mean, that's it, topsy-turvy in the Christian life. He says, if then I do that which I would not, I consent unto the law that it is good. Now, 
then it is no more I that do it, but sin that dwelleth in me. For I know that in me, that is in my flesh, dwelleth no good thing. The little word good, I studied it many years ago. It's the same word that is used to describe the juice that is used at the Lord's table and the wine that Jesus made at the wedding of Cana in John chapter six. It's a word which means purely unmixed with anything, just pure. And he said, that is in my life, in my flesh, there's nothing that is purely innocently good. And he said, and that's interesting, dwelleth no good thing for to will is present with me, but how to perform that which is good, I find not. For the good that I would, I do not. But the evil which I would not, that I do. Now, if I do that, I would not. It is no more I that do it, but sin that dwelleth in me. I find then a law that when I would do good, evil is present with me. Paul fought the same battles that you and I fight every single day of our lives. We fight our flesh. That's what we do. But, you know, here we find that he is our life because Christ is in us. And by the way, 1 John, or 1 John 4, 4, no, greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. Victory is definitely possible. Number six, again, if you're taking notes, he is our welcome Preacher, I've never heard anybody say that Jesus is our welcome. Well, you heard it just now. Acts chapter 7 and verse 56. The story is familiar, even though the reference is not. In Acts chapter 7 and verse 56, here we find the story of a young man, a deacon by the name of Stephen. The first martyr for Christ that we know of in the New Testament. And it says here, and said, behold... I see the heavens opened and the son of man standing on the right hand of God. That was Jesus that was standing on the right hand of God. Jesus lives in heaven. And it is my belief that he welcomes us when we get there. I, I say, how's that possible? I don't know. I guess he breathed the, the old universe into existence in a single breath and he made man from dust to the ground. I'm assuming he can greet all of us when we get there. And I'm sure that he can. In this verse, though, we find that he is standing at the right hand of the father when Stephen dies. Now, listen to this. It sounds almost like a contradiction in scripture. In Hebrews chapter 12 and verse 2, we know the verses by heart, looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is set down at the right hand of the throne of God. Wait a minute. Acts 7.56 says he's standing. Hebrews chapter 12 and verse 2 says he's sitting. Which one is right? <laughs> well, they both are. But I want you to notice those words set down at the right hand of the throne of God. It seems to be a contradiction, but it's not. No contradiction at all. The reason he's standing is because he's welcoming home Stephen. And he stood up to welcome him. It's like an usher standing at the door of Timberline Baptist Church. You know what their function is? Their function is not to stand there and look intelligent and handsome or anything like that. Their job is to welcome you into this building to hand you a bulletin, to shake your hand and say, howdy, howdy, I'm glad that you're here. Thank you for coming. When Stephen died, Jesus stood up and Jesus met him at the, day, at the gate, if you want to use that terminology. One of these days when Danny Parton dies, because he got saved 60 years ago, I believe with all my heart that Jesus will greet me standing up, not sitting down. And I believe he'll take me by the hand. And as a picture that someone has drawn and painted that has been published all over, it's called my first, the first day in heaven. And it's an individual running to the Lord Jesus and Jesus putting his arms around him and him putting his arms around Jesus. What a day that's going to be. Oh, what a day that will be when my Jesus I shall see when I look upon his face, the one who saved me by his grace, when he takes me by the hand and leads me to the promised land. What a day, glorious day that will be. And I believe that he'll stand up to greet you too. Because one of these days, your body's going to be moldering in the grave. Before that ever happens, when your spirit leaves your body, Jesus will greet you in heaven, just exactly like he did Stephen. And I believe that's universal across the board. He'll do that with all of those who have trusted Christ as their Savior. 
This world is not my home. I'm just a passing through. My treasures are laid up somewhere beyond the blue. The angels beckon me from heaven's open door, and I can't feel at home in this world anymore. And then the last one I want to give you tonight, don't look at your watch. And if you've got nitroglycerin tablets, you may want to put one under your tongue because it's not quite been an hour. But I want you to see the last thing that he is when it says here that is he is he that liveth. Number seven, he's our understander. Can you spell that, Pastor? Mm -hmm. U-N-D-E-R, S-T-A-N-D-E-R. He's our understander. You ever talk to somebody that just doesn't understand you? <laughs> One of the funniest things that ever happens in our church is when somebody asks me a computer question. And I'll start, to expl I'll start explaining it to them. And they look at me like this. And when I'm done giving all the wonderful knowledge that I have on that particular subject, I'll stare right at them and I'll say, you didn't understand a single word that I said, did you? And they go, uh-uh, not one word. Well, Jesus is not that way. He's our understander. Do you have your Bible? This is such a great verse. Hebrews chapter four and verse 15. For we have not an high priest which cannot be touched with the feeling of our infirmities, but was in all points tempted, like as we are, yet without sin. There are those who say, well, you can't understand this because you've never been through it. Jesus has been through it. He says, well, you can't understand what I'm talking about because this has never happened to you. Not with Jesus. It says he was tempted, he was tested in all points like as we are, yet without, he's the one that had victory. He's the one that didn't sin. And notice the words, if you would please, in all points tempted like as we are. This wonderful scripture, it is he that suffered every suffering that we suffer, every pain that we, that we have had, uh, every disappointment that we've ever known, every trial that we've ever gone through, everything, he has suffered those things. The thirst on the cross, the beatings with the cat of nine tails. You think you hurt? Can you imagine how he felt after 39 stripes with the cat of nine tails, ripping open his flesh, and but yet not killing him? Or taking a crown of thorns and plaiting it upon his head? Or taking a stick and beating him in the head with it? Or any of the rest of it? No, we've not gone through that. But he has gone through that. And anything less than that is what we've gone through. He was tested or tempted in all points like as we were, yet without sin. And so he has hurt with every hurt that we hurt. And he's been lonely with every lonely that we've ever experienced and every sadness that we've ever had. He persecuted as we've ever been persecuted. And there is absolutely no condition whatsoever in which the Lord Jesus has not faced. He suffered it all for us. Say, Pastor, how do you know it was everything? Well, first of all, you have no idea and I have no idea everything that he suffered that's not written in the Bible. You realize that? The Bible says that if, if everything that Jesus did that was good while he was living on this earth, it said that all the libraries and all the world and the sky and all the rest of it, if all of it was used as a parchment, it would never be able to hold everything that he did. The Bible does not carry everything that Jesus went through, but it does say he was tested, he was tempted in all points like as we are. That's comforting to me. That means that when I had that pain in my back last night and I decided I was going to take some, uh, some ibuprofen, and I did, and I slept pretty good after that. That was good. That means that Jesus knew the pain that I had last night. That means that everything that I've ever gone through, Jesus has suffered in one way or another. And there's absolutely no condition in this life in which our Lord has not, been, has not faced. And it means that he can understand us and no one else can understand, but he can understand everything. You see, I'm so glad that we have a high priest like that. I'm glad Jesus is like that. And tonight I've only given you seven things. When he says, I am he that liveth, what does it mean? That means that we're saved by his life. It means that he's our advocate. It means that he's our intercessor. It means that he's our mediator. It means that he is our life. That means he is our welcome and he is our understander, all seven of these things. And by the way, couldn't you make a list even longer than that? I think you could. If you sat down and just thought through it, you could probably make a list twice that long or three times that long, or maybe even since you know Jesus like you do, a hundred times that long.
to write down all that Jesus is. Jesus is all the world to me. Everything in my life. And all of these things and more are what Jesus is doing right now for us in heaven. And I want to thank God that John could say, and we can say with him, that Jesus is he that liveth. Revelation chapter 1 and verse 18, I am, that's it, I am, I am he that liveth. What a great promise God has given to us. Are you glad you're saved tonight? And aren't you glad that you have a Savior that is like that? complete in every way that you can imagine. And he's all of those things to you. Some of you this week are going to need him to be an understander, aren't you? Yeah, I know. And some of you this week are going to need Jesus to, well, you don't want him to be your welcome <laughs> this week, that's for sure. Uh, because if you die, you want him to be your welcome, but none of you really want to die this week, I don't think. But remember, that'll happen at the end of your life. And also, the fact that he is your life, you're going to need that this week. And the fact that he's your mediator, some uh, double tongue, silver tongue devil's going to come your way and accuse you. And you can say, hey, Jesus is the one I can run to for help. He's the one that is my advocate. Uh, he's your intercessor. He is the one that gives you access to the Lord. He is your advocate. He is your life. He is all of those things. And you just may need at least one of them this week. And I mean that with all my heart. You may need at least one of those during this week. But my guess is this, and I think I'm accurate. You're probably going to need more than one in the next seven days. And let's pray.